Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, I'll just add, and, and we'll see a lot more imagery here shortly, but for folks that spent time along the pipeline route during active construction, where you see that silt fencing and all of the construction like materials um, laying around, like those photos were all captured within the past year, right? So all that abandoned construction infrastructure is stuff that is still out in places or you know, maybe intentionally placed as part of you know remediation. But that is those ecosystems are what they still look like right a year after construction, the summer after active construction. Um, those are not images from the, the during construction period. So just to imagine right what this land is still looking like. And to now show us in, in really striking relief, um, we're going to have some of the drone footage captured by Ron Turney, another volunteer with Um, And he'll be giving some voiceover narration explaining what you're looking at uh, from one of the sites that is experiencing ongoing uh, aquifer breaching. So we'll be looking at LaSalle Creek drone footage next with some of the narration from Ron so you can understand what you're looking at. Boozoo, Wadukawadamakwag presents Enbridge Line 3 and 93 Environmental Impacts. In this video, we're going to cover aquifer breaches at LaSalle Creek and related issues. So let's get into it. Wadukawa Adamaklug and partner organizations conducted a thermal flyover of the Enbridge Line 3 and 93 route last year on November 27th and 28th. Our data shows Enbridge and Bar Engineering's corrective action plan failed to identify and miss many active seeps in the area. Their CIP identified seven seeps, but ours shows 10 to 12 additional seeps not being addressed. In this image on the left here, you see seven seeps identified in the corrective action plan by Enbridge and Bar Engineering. But on the right, our thermal data from November 27th and 28th shows seven to 10 additional seeps that have been covered with fiber matting, not included in the corrective action plan. In this image, you see one of the seeps covered with fiber matting, still releasing 45 to 50 degree groundwater being run off into filter bags in the trees. Here's a thermal version of the previous image showing the fiber matting with the 45 to 50 degree groundwater emerging from the sides and pooling on top, along with the water running off in the filter bags. Another issue at LaSalle Creek is there's only one weir installed to measure the flow of one, one seep, but we can show seven to 10 additional seeps leaking water. Here you can see seep number four, and there's a small flow from this one. We estimate three to five gallons a minute, or around 216,000 gallons per month. Since there's no weir box here, we ask how much water has really been released in the entire valley from all of these extra seeps. Another issue we see here at LaSalle Creek is the easement becoming too saturated. The additional seven to 10 seeps have been releasing water for the past year and turned this into a safety hazard on public land. Here you see filter bags attached to the weir with excess grout running off downhill towards these bags which are stacked 15 to 17 high with additional grout running downhill towards the South Creek. It's been over one year since the completion of Enbridge's Line 3 and 93 replacement project. They're still trying to fix their failures at Walker Brook, LaSalle Valley, Fond du Lac, and many other locations we've been monitoring. Wadukawa, Amaquag, and Mako Initiative will remain on the front lines protecting our environment, clean water, and monoman. Miigwech. Thank you for that, Ron. I'm going to turn it over now to Laura Triplett, who is going to break down some of the geology to help us understand what this means when water is seeping out of the ground like that, what that means for the land, um, how we can understand that for folks that are maybe, you know, not knowledgeable about aquifers and how they, how they function as part of these ecosystems. So I will turn it over to Laura to share some of that context and to help us understand what we're looking at. Hi everyone, I'm going to give Delaney a minute to get the slides up here. Um, I'm a geologist, I'm a professor of geology at Gustavus Adolphus College in South Central Minnesota. 
I do this work um, separate from my institution as a pro bono scientist for this group. Great, thank you. So in the work that Jackie and Ron have been describing here, we're focusing on two of the kinds of damage, there are others. Um, and what Ron was just showing you at LaSalle is in the first category here on the left. It's the puncturing of aquifers and other major disruptions to water connections and flow. The second category is drilling fluid blowouts like what we witnessed in the Mississippi River just outside of Itasca State Park. And those have resulted in what's an undisclosed but undoubtedly massive amount of drilling fluid permanently emplaced into river floodplains. Um, by the way, the state of Pennsylvania recently filed 48 criminal charges against a pipeline company there for um, underground drilling fluid releases like this. Um, Minnesota didn't or maybe couldn't file any of their different state laws. Um, also make a mental note of this temporary bridge here you see over the Mississippi. Um, I'll come back to how damaging those bridges um, might be in a bit. So next slide, please, Delaney. Um, so back to LaSalle, what Ron showed you is a terrible tragedy and was entirely preventable. What happened is this here, uh, you can see the brand new clear cut corridor that Enbridge made along the top and left side of this photo and the temporary road there too. If we peel back the land surface and this animation, can you go back, um, Delaney, can you go back one and try this again? Um, hopefully we'll be able to see, okay, the um, layers on the right there, you can see layers of sand and gravel and also silt and clay that have um, the silt and clay kind of act as a cap. They act as a confining layer. And cold, or a cap is under what we call a confined aquifer down below. Um, Delaney, sorry, if you could go back up one slide, the animations are getting ahead of us a little bit. Back one more, up, thank you. Just leave it here for a minute. Um, so you can see that on the right. Now, this is really sensitive wetlands. It's really hard, in fact, impossible to um, trench through. So what Enbridge needed to do was install metal sheet piling into the land to stabilize trench walls. Otherwise, the trench walls would collapse. Um, as soon as they did that, though, they installed them about 30 feet deep. Their consultant in 2020 did say they shouldn't pound sheet piling more than 20 feet deep in this um, very sensitive, complicated geology, but they went to 30 feet. Um, in my professional opinion, even 20 feet was going to be a reckless move. They, moved, they punctured through that yellow silt and clay, and these gray rectangles are, are supposed to illustrate that sheet piling that was pounded in. When they did that, they punched through and water then started erupting up to the surface. Now there were originally some small natural springs along the valley walls and actually it created some really cool little micro ecosystems. That was known before construction. But once construction happened, this amount of water, it's much more water, it's different temperature, it's different chemistry, it's gonna change the nature of the wetlands here and potentially dewater the entire aquifer below. Um, that could cause compaction, land sinking, could cause other wetlands to dry up. So that's where we're at. So um, this was uh, sheet piling installed last year during construction. So if you could move forward, Delaney, on the slides. Let's see how the animations work here. So they installed their fix for this was to pound about 135 metal pipes into the ground and inject grout, tens of thousands of gallons of grout, basically um, concrete um, into those pipes to try and plug those holes. Um, it basically created about a 23 foot tall um, concrete wall underground here, about the length of two and a half football fields that would 
act as an underground dam and keep groundwater from moving down the valley wall into the creek. Um, that is happening in some of those uh, images that Ron was showing you, we can see evidence that that is indeed happening now. But even with all of this grout, the fix didn't work. Um, what's scary is water still seeping up to the surface now. And also what's scary is that Enbridge didn't tell the state of Minnesota that this was happening until July of 2022. Well, we at Waduka Wadamikwag had known it months earlier from the work we've been doing. Um, so I said that LaSalle is a terrible tragedy. Why is it terrible? This is literally the beginning of the Mississippi River. And beginnings are important. Things that happen in headwaters like this, changes that happen to streams can have a cascade effect, a domino effect all the way downstream. And I've learned from my partners in this work that these places have value in and of themselves. Um, the way I see my partners greeting these streams as relatives is a good analog. I think it's actually a more human analog for exactly what Western science has been trying to teach us anyway, um, that our lives and our livelihoods are bound up in the integrity of the water and the land. Um, lastly, this outcome was knowable and indeed known um, in some aspects. And these are examples of permanent impacts from normal construction activities, um, not temporary as was assumed during the permitting process. Okay, so now we're gonna go, oh, one more, uh, if you could go forward one more slide, Delaney. So Ron's, we're gonna go back to Ron in a second here. He's gonna show you another location that we've been monitoring. Um, the state has not talked about this other site publicly yet. And this site, Walker Brook, um, was not included in the recent so-called comprehensive enforcement action. So Walker Brook is just a few miles from LaSalle Valley, as you can see on this map. You can see Lake Itasca down there on the bottom, the official headwaters of the Mississippi, a very popular state park in the state of Minnesota. Now, the state didn't make Enbridge study the geology in Walker Brook. Um, before approving the route or starting construction. So we know a lot less about it. Um, as far as I can tell, Enbridge didn't really do any geotechnical work to speak of. But I can tell you that it certainly has very similar geology. It's in a deep valley like LaSalle. It's full of complicated layers of glacial sediments and post-glacial sediments. Um, it's full of interconnected wetland ecosystems like LaSalle. And, but this is really cool. Um, this is actually in a completely different watershed. And I didn't draw it on here, but kind of striking from the Southwest to the Northeast through this, there's a continental divide, the Laurentian divide. So that LaSalle and the Mississippi flow, as you know, South toward the Gulf of Mexico, but Walker Brook actually heads toward the Red River of the North and Hudson Bay. And I hope that um, if you can come to the evening session tonight, Victoria is going to talk more about that, that triple divide that we have that makes Minnesota really special and um, indeed sacred to a lot of um, Native peoples in this country. So Walker Brook, I'm going to turn it back over to Ron so we can see that video of Walker Brook. Buzu, Madoka Wainamakwa presents Enbridge Line 393, Environmental Impacts. In this video we cover groundwater issues at Walker Brook. So let's get into it. As you may know, Wadukawa and Amaquad and partner organizations performed a thermal flyover of the Enbridge Line 3 and 93 reroute project. On November 27th and 28th of last year, top of the screen, you can see a utility corridor and in the center of the screen, you see the Enbridge Line 93 pipe with oil flowing through it. But you also see a bright white signatures indicative of emerging groundwater with three seeps on the west hill and multiple seeps on the east hill. There's a sinkhole and seep directly above the pipe in multiple locations and you have tubing running off the groundwater into filter bags and the white that you see in the image is 45 to 50 degree groundwater. Here on April 1st you can see 20 structures on the hillside 
trying to save it from eroding away from emerging groundwater rushing downhill into Walker Brook. This video on August 1st, you can see on the west bank three seeps of groundwater emerging and being run off into filter bags. The dark indicates 45 to 50 degree groundwater. The estimated flow at this location is 10 to 30 gallons a minute, nearly 1 million gallons per month. In this thermal video, you see the yellow signatures as the gray fabric acting as a thermal barrier. On August 10th, you see the main seat covered with gray fabric with uh, tubing transporting cold water over into filter bags in the woods. And you also see the seeps and sinkholes forming directly above the active pipeline. This thermal image shows the main seep covered in gray fabric and the dark spots are cold groundwater emerging downhill. Here on September 15th, you can see the main seep surrounded by timber matting as a new work, work area emerges with boring remnants at the top left and water still being transported off to the bottom right. Here on October 24th, you can still see groundwater emerging from the three seeps on the west side. One estimate is 50 to 60 gallons per minute is still being released daily from this location, which is around 2 million gallons per month for the past year. It's 24 million gallons of water. It's been over one year since the completion of Enbridge's Line 3 93 replacement project, and they're still trying to fix their failures at Walker Brook, LaSalle Valley, Fond du Lac, and many other locations we've been monitoring. This is what happens when federal and state agencies fail to honor indigenous treaties, conduct thorough environmental impact studies, listen to real science, and allow a foreign corporation like Enbridge to run roughshod in our most fragile ecosystems. Wadukawad Amakwad and Mukwa Initiative will remain on the front lines protecting our environment, clean water, and Manoman. Miigwech. Great. Um, okay, so Walker Brook is an example of a site that wasn't included in the state's recent comprehensive enforcement action. Um, and again, hasn't been discussed uh, publicly. So Enbridge, as far as we know, did no ge geotechnical assessment here before construction and it wasn't required. Um, in my professional opinion, and actually what I recommended before construction started in testimony was that there should have been multiple soil borings and at least one year of continuous groundwater monitoring here before a route should have been approved uh, through the valley. Um, this was also the lack of geotechnical knowledge. It's also the reason why there was that terrible aquifer breach on the border of the Fond du Lac reservation. Just by the way, it's the same issue. They didn't do enough science beforehand to know what the situation was. It still could have been anticipated because I did, but anyway. Um, next slide, please, uh, Delaney, thank you. So on the left here, we can see a, it's just Google Earth of Walker Brook on the left. On the right is the same image with the National Wetlands Inventory overlaid on that. This route crossed through what is very difficult terrain for pipeline construction, and what is also very delicate and not restorable from an ecosystem perspective, peat bogs. Um, Peat bogs are, take thousands of years to form typically, but in an afternoon can be wrecked by this kind of construction. Um, now, because less is known about the specific sediment layers at Walker Brook, and because the agencies haven't yet um, responded to my request to see what they do know, I actually can't give you a detailed technical analysis of this site yet. What I can be sure of is that groundwater, as Ron said, is continuously bubbling up to the surface at multiple discrete spots on both sides of the valley. That water is 45 degrees, we know from on-site confirmation, indicating that the water is from at least eight to 10 feet deep in the ground, possibly deeper. So I hope that Enbridge or the state or somebody is studying whether Enbridge has breached another confined aquifer here, or whether this is instead some kind of 
soil piping effect that construction caused that is concentrating upwelling water and destabilizing these hillsides. This to me is critically important to understand what happened here before any other pipelines are approved in the United States. We need to know what happened. And we had also hoped that they would do an in-depth study of the hydrology before allowing Enbridge to try and quote, quote unquote fix this site. But as Jamie's video said earlier last weekend, there was heavy equipment moving in and out of the construction zone 24 seven on a Saturday night. So we figure they must be doing something major, but um, I, I don't actually know what they're doing. Um, is this an aquifer breach? It looks like part of my slide might've gotten cut off. I was trying to highlight the, you know, the information we have. We can see water bubbling up under artesian conditions. We can see the cold temperature. We have water chemistry that we are still um, analyzing and understanding. Um, could you go to the next slide, please, Delaney? So one last thing, um, Enbridge, um, I need to finish up because I know we're running out of time. Um, there's one other site that um, hasn't, again, wasn't included in the enforcement action, but we want to show you a little bit. Um, could you go to the next slide, please, Delaney? Um, this is Moose Lake. And um, like on the top is the thermal imagery again, the white dots are groundwater upwelling. And on the bottom Google Earth image is where we've done some on-site confirmation. Um, notice here, um, so I know these points look really small, but if you've ever like pricked a water balloon with a pin, you know that water can come out of a small hole pretty fast. A lot of water can drain quickly. Um, the on-site confirmation, it looks to us like these are corners. Perhaps this is bridge footing from a temporary construction bridge that they might have um, built across this site. We don't know, or maybe it's a sheet piling issue again. Um, again, hopefully someone is studying this to see what caused these um, apparent punctures so that it can be avoided in future projects. Um, next slide, last slide. So um, as a scientist, um, the questions I'm left with after looking at these three case studies is we don't know how much water was um, drained away. Um, they aren't measuring all of it as Ron showed, so we, we won't ever actually know. And I hope that someone's studying whether there are permanent impacts to these aquifers. Um, again, we don't know. These are complicated geologies up there. It would take actually quite a bit of effort to really understand these enough to protect them. And finally, as a scientist, I'd put a plea out there that any such future projects have in-depth geotechnical investigation and a year's worth of hydrologic monitoring at every stream and every wetland crossing before a route is approved. Uh, because otherwise we can literally never know. We will literally never know the extent of the damage here because um, that baseline information wasn't collected. And so my lesson learned as a citizen um, is that, you know, hey, Minnesota, we were outmatched uh, by this multi-billion dollar company. Um, it's my assessment that if we wanna protect our water, our state agencies need probably more funding our state agencies need more independence, and um, we probably need stronger laws in our state for our agencies to enforce in order to do the protection we expect. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. We'll turn right over to Jeff to speak about some of the barriers to action um, that Wadukawadamakwag folks have faced in doing this work, right? Um, the citizen scientists monitoring, and um, we'll move towards closing with some final words from Ron about how we can think about these impacts affecting future projects. So over to you, Jeff. Thanks so much. The barriers that we're talking about are both uh, physical barriers and metaphorical barriers. Uh, we see all kinds of barriers, a cement wall that goes almost half a mile across an aquifer and peat bog. We see silt fence by the hundreds of miles that prevent the frogs and the turtles and the small animals from moving through their natural environment that are all left behind. And the metaphorical part of this is that we see barriers to communication and effective communication. We don't understand why the state and other federal agencies aren't acting on this. So uh, we're continuing our volunteer action. Uh, we're recording the permanent impacts 
And we proposed a memorandum of agreement with the state that seeks to repair trust, share our knowledge, and eliminate the cultural barriers to communication. Next slide. The challenge is one of communication. It's an information overload. It's complex. It's competing messages. It's a, a matter of status, cultural status, and lack of trust. Our response is to show up. We have a dedicated group of volunteers that are showing up and saying, what do we need to do to show and, and, and make the public and the state aware of these promised conditions have been violated. There was to be no damage. Next slide. There was not to be any permanent uh, issues. And, and we were assured that to be true, it wasn't. So where can we find trust? Our water connections are broken and we're all suffering. Next slide. There's been three civil settlements so far, one for Clearbrook, one for LaSalle, and one for uh, Fond du Lac for the rock or for ruptures, uh, fines, settlements, stipulations were ordered. And also all of those said that there would be no further action by the state of Minnesota. That doesn't mean that we won't take action because the escape clause is that if new information comes forward, that these are bigger problems, new problems occur, or they find that Enbridge and their consultants were dishonest, these can be, be reopened. We have criminal charges pending in Clearwater County against Enbridge. It's the same condition. They have a year to prove that they tell the truth. We want to challenge that. And we think they're not telling the whole story and they're taking advantage of some of the physical barriers we have to understanding these things. So we're moving ahead, new information, uh, and, and we aren't going to allow them to continue to conceal these. Next slide. So we have proposed back in the end of August, a really kind of complicated six page uh, memorandum agreement. Um, and, and the principle is do no more harm. We want to get together on this, but let's stop the harm. And we're seeing many of the workings of this summer that are investigation or restoration are causing continued trouble. We need to continue thermal investigations. Uh, they're such an extraordinary tool. Uh, it's easy to do from drones. We can identify these sites that are problems. And we need a complete failure analysis that identifies all of these problems across the headwaters before they move ahead with line five. They could repeat these same mistakes if we aren't diligent about controlling this. So the, import, the MOA has been sent. Next slide. We haven't heard back. We've sent it to the PCA commissioner, the DNR commissioner, the governor, Keith Ellison. Who's going to respond? Next slide. We're hopeful, but we've taken another track and gone down a federal approach. And we've asked uh, our congressional delegation and Betty McCollum has written letters now to the Corps of Engineers and the US EPA to address our concerns. We're waiting to hear back. Next slide. Who will respond? Thank you.